I want to say thank you to um, the unit and particularly uh, Nezi Swa Didi for having invited me um, to make my small contribution to um, an area of interest that's fairly new, I think. Um, mine is going to be a, a short presentation. I've only been given 15 minutes. Um, and I'm going to specifically talk from the perspective of an African researcher um, conducting research in African communities. Um, and how, I, um, how I've sort of seen myself and as, as representing research, but how I've seen myself as a researcher therefore um, in the research that um, we conduct in communities. Um, and I thought I would start with this um, quote from a, a paper written by Simons and Christopher um, in 2013, which I thought um, really captures um, the spirit of how research, in, even in our context, this was written in the context of research conducted in Native, Native America, um, amongst Native Americans, but I felt that it really fits um, um, our context. And, and it says, past researchers have disempowered communities, imposed stereotypes that reinforced internalized racism, and conducted research that benefited the careers of individual researchers or even science at large, but brought no tangible benefit to the communities struggling with significant health disparities. Many tribal nations have provided accounts of researchers who have exploited tribes by coming in, taking information from tribal members, and providing nothing in return. This is not distant history, rather it characterizes much of present behavior. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> I have more than 15 minutes. Um, so, so our research um, practice in, in, in South Africa, in, 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 in South Africa as, a, as, an, as an African, um, as a country in Africa, um, is largely informed by a Western model of research, um, where we come in from the outside and we impose the research agenda on communities. We set the research questions, we determine what the problems are. And it may be that, um, and, it, and it is sometimes the case that of course something happens to get us thinking, well maybe we should look into that. But it's, um, certainly in my experience as a researcher, it's not, some, it's not a process I've been a part of. Um, to my shame, um, you know, we don't go into communities and find out what are the issues, what are the problems, what do we, you want us to, to, to investigate. We come in um, from the outside, and as someone, um, in one of the earlier speakers um, said in, in, in the morning, we essentially also follow the money, right? Our research agenda is dictated by funders, what they want who don't, funders who don't even come from this context. So it, that, that gets even more complicated. But, um, and, and so what we do is we analyze and diagnose issues in, in, in these local communities as external observers. Um, and we come up with interventions that have had no input from, um, um, from locals in how they should be designed. And then we are surprised when they don't work. Um, a classic case of this is, is um, um, and exclusive breast, is, is exclusive breastfeeding. The, the whole um, um, efforts, the, the efforts to promote it, to um, increase bre exclusive breastfeeding rates in, in this country, and similar contexts in in, um, in, in developing countries. Um, and I know it's a complex issue, exclusive breastfeeding, but I feel that. The research that's been conducted so far has not included communities to look at what and how their practices um, impact on exclusive breastfeeding. Why is it that um, we still see such low rates despite big interventions that are funded, very expensive trials that go out um, into the field and then um, exclusive breastfeeding rates remain so low? So I think it's, it's just an example of, of exactly that. A few years ago, I was part of a research group that tried to sit down and think about how to, um, to, to, to really look at the at exclusive breastfeeding and see how, what it is in communities that um, makes it so difficult 
for um, mothers to um, exclusively breastfeed for the first six months. And we sat in that meeting, it was in Guazul Natal, rural Guazul Natal, and um, it became clear that it would be such a huge undertaking to go into these communities to find out what it is about their practices, about their beliefs about infant feeding, um, that influences how they feed their children and, and that influences their um, reluctance or, or even just not buying into the idea that you can give a child can survive, a baby can survive on milk, on breast milk only for six months. And I think because it turned out to be such a big it, it seemed to be such a big in, um, undertaking. All of us sort of then went back into our little holes and, and we just never discussed it again. It was meant to be a process that would start um, us moving forward to engage communities and it never took off. And um, so what ultimately um, happens then with implementing a Western model of research in our context context, and I'm speaking in the South African context now, as a, a public health researcher, is that it ends up, we end up pathologizing blackness and, and the poor. The entire teaching on public health is about how black people um, live and their conditions. So if we go to HIV research, um, sexual and reproductive health, maternal and child health, violence, um, research, all of it centers on, 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 black on black communities and black populations, and by black I mean it in the broadest term. Um, and what it does, um, the unfortunate result of that is that it, it does send out a message that there is something fundamentally wrong about being black. Um, when you think of HIV, you don't even in my own research, when I'm thinking of a question, when we're sitting and thinking about a research question for a, you know, for a funding call, or when I'm thinking about which popular, you know, sampling, I'm thinking about black people, it just comes naturally. And that's because that's just how, um, that's how we've been taught, and, and, and that's what we practice. Um, and of course, a, a frequent retort is that, well, white people are a hard to reach population, which I think is <laughs> kind of crazy. Because when you think of ha hard to reach populations, you think of, you know, um, uh, the work that my twin sister Yanga does with um, transactional sex workers, you know, drug um, addicts, it's people that you literally can't find. But in our context, um, rich and middle class and white populations have become a hard to reach population. Um, and so that's the frequent record. Um, recently, I'm part of a study group that's looking at spatial inequality. It's um, a few uh, institutions are, are part of this. And when we were selecting which um, communities, which sites we would um, conduct the research in, each of us had to come into the meeting already having selected, thought about different sites. And everyone had, in the Western Cape, all of the townships and all of the colored neighborhoods on their papers. And I, and I said, and I raised an issue and I said, but why do you not have the southern suburbs here? Why do you not have the middle class here? And um, one of the um, partners who who's, who's comes from an, an institution that's outside of South Africa, he said, he was a bit stunned at first, and then he said, well, um, because, well, I don't want this to become about race. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? You know, and basically, um, um, he, and I could see that he had not thought about it really himself. It's just that it's a knee-jerk reaction. You just think, well, why are you going to go and talk about talk to white people about poverty and inequality? And and the next thing was, how are we going to get them? They are impossible to get. They're not going to want to participate in this research. And to an extent, that is true, but also that's been fed by the fact that we have not targeted middle class. Um, um, population, so we don't know how to reach them because we've not tried to. So, I, so we ended up dis, de, um, deciding in that group meeting that we are going to try, we're going to include them, we're going to include the southern suburbs, we're going to include white populations because we want to know their own experience, their lived experience of inequality, even if it comes from the other side of the coin. It's important in giving a balanced story of what's going on. And so 
different and I've started to see this coming up and I'm starting to challenge myself in any work that I do. I try to, it's not possible in all topics and all research areas, of course, but where possible, I try to think about it. Could you see this a bit differently? Could looking at a different population, will it add something here? Um, and um, so, in our attempt, in, in our practice as researchers, I feel that we end up being um, poverty voyeurs, no different than um, poverty tourists. We go into communities, and there are times when I've felt extremely uncomfortable. And these are communities that I have experienced in being a part of, because I come from, I mean, I come from um, a rural area in the Eastern Cape. Um, but so these are communities, these are people that I, and that I also think of as my own people, but I am an outsider in those contexts. And there are p p moments when I've sat with an intense discomfort because of the line of questioning designed by me and others that, that I could see taking place and how intrusive and invasive it was um, becoming in those instances. Um, back in my, you know, when I was still doing my DFIL, field work for my DFIL, um, part of the instrument that I was using needed um, was looking at cupboard, the cupboard inventory. And it's a, it's a methodology that's been tested and used many times before. In fact, I adapted somebody else's tool for it. But when we went into, into the communities um, that we were um, doing, conducting the research in, and I asked this mama, who was very poor, I asked her to open her cupboard. In fact, before I even asked, I knew something that I just didn't feel good about it, about asking it, but it's in the instrument. So I asked her to open her cupboard, and she looked at me, and I could see the discomfort. Um, and sadly, that day, she did open her cupboard for me, but I had to go back and think about what, what, does, it, what does this mean? It's humiliating, it's shameful. And people who are poor, and I say this as coming from those communities, have dignity, and they, um, and they, they, they pride themselves in who they are. They don't want, just recently on Saturday, I was conducting a focus group discussion on, on another study, and somebody said, well, we have a saying in, in, in the course which says, which means your, how do I translate it loosely, but basically your poverty should not be on your face. So those people are not gonna want to open their cupboards so that you can see how little food they have. There are other studies I've heard about that investigate the plate, what's on. So those um, methods, yes, we've received ethics um, approval for those studies. We are allowed to go into those communities, but we need to be more reflective and more thoughtful about um, doing those. And, and I've learned since then, since the old days of being a student, to trust my voice. If I sit in, a, in, a, in, a, in a somebody's household and I, and, I, and I feel uncomfortable about saying, I don't do it. Um, regardless of what the, the of what's on um, the instrument and, and, and the protocol and what I'm supposed to follow, not that that's what I'm advocating. This could start a whole other revolution. <laughs> we should follow protocol, but and in fact, what it reflects, I suppose, is that we should think about it at design stage. And if we include communities, this is what, this is the thing. If my research included communities from inception, from and and even before that from when, when, when we are still thinking about where to go and we find out what are the issues, what do you particularly want to address in this community and how do you want to address this. The Simons and Christopher reference that I gave at the beginning, the paper they wrote, they've gone so far as to include community members in data analysis, which I think is just completely radical. They include them, they come and they select themes, they agree on the themes that have been um, chosen from, the com from, from communities that's how radical it needs to get. And then you won't even get to a point, a situation where you are thinking about not going according to protocol. So what can we do differently? Um, I think <laughs> Prof. Kopano wanted me to, to, to bring a, a rather positive spin on this. And, and I hope <laughs> this part of it will. Um, but, and I think it's just going to take investment in time and resources. The reason why we abandoned is that research group years ago when we were looking at exclusive, we abandoned it because it just seemed that it would take too much time and money. And because we follow the money, funders tell us you have 12 months to implement a study. And none of that funding is set aside for engaging communities for you know, months um, on end. 
Um, so in a sense, it does affect the funding model, it needs to change. But we need to invest time and money. It's not going to just happen on its own. It takes time. Community work actually takes time. Um, and we also need to change the way we train researchers. I think more than anything else, it needs to happen in the classroom. We need to teach our researchers, coming, upcoming researchers, they need to know that black people are not the only people who experience social ills, that that's not the only way necessarily to look at problems. Um, they need to know that, and I'm not shooting down you know, the Western model, I think there must be something great, as, as, as is the case with most things in life. It's just that there's a problem when we adopt one single framework and way of thinking and stick to it and uphold it as the only way. And so if we start to bring in more plural ways of, of thinking about and, and engaging and, and generating knowledge, we are going to um, start going towards a direction that will um, decolonize research in, in Africa and make it more um, specific and, 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 and more relevant. So we need to reflect collectively with communities who are often the target of our research um, on how to decolonize, that that's where it even starts. We can talk to how do you want it done differently. Um, my feeling on consent procedures, for instance, is that and I hope I don't get into trouble for saying, but I don't think in the current form that we do it, I don't think it's possible to get true consent in our communities. People, in, in the current study I'm running now in Langa, when people don't want to participate in our research, in our project, what they do is they simply don't show up or they give you the wrong number. They don't know how to say no. So even when you've gone through the whole process and tried to explain as much as possible that it's completely voluntary, they don't need to, if they don't want to, they don't know, and that's because we come in as authority, and many of them think of us as, you know, depending on what study you're doing, they're going to call you the nurse, the teacher, the social worker, the doctor, and that already changes the power dynamic. They feel that they can't say no. So if we're coming into to, to communities and we say, how do you want us to conduct research in a way that's meaningful and respectful and relevant and helpful for your context, for, these, for the, 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 the context um, that we're in, that will we'll make some headway. Form genuine partnerships, uphold the dignity of research participants, um, and acknowledge indigenous um, knowledge systems. Engage communities on you know, genesis from the start of the research project before you even determine what the research question is. Where possible, it's not always going to be possible. Where possible, engage communities. And even if it's not possible in, in engaging them in the research question itself, because you've already received funding for it, you could still go back to the community and find out how they want, what the problem is from their um, perspective and how they think um, it could be tackled. Uh, develop and adapt methods and approaches um, that are sensitive to our settings. And, um, and lastly, some questions, as was the example with, with my cupboard inventory story, some questions, no matter how interesting or even important, are just not worth exploring if they are going to trample on people's dignity. Thank you.